Chapter 14, 134, 5, whatever you have. That one. Everybody used to always say too. Come again when you can't stay so long. Arrows out of place. How'd that happen? That's weird. We should be able to. It's it's a picture, so you should be able to slide down. Yeah. Where do you want it? Um, up to the left of violence. Oh, pretty. <laughs> heaven. That's what heaven looks like. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you don't like purple, that's not they heaven. Well, I like purple. <laughs> they ain't got no fish at home. <laughs> when I see it, I, I'm really bad. I keep thinking about how much mess that tree would make in your yard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, what is that? Is that a weeping willow? Or something? That is. That's a cactus. That is a Fuji garden in Kawachi, Japan. Uh, a Kawachi yeah, Fuji garden in Kitakyushu, Japan. Excuse me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All those who care, raise your right hand. <laughs> I usually say that when I get. Greek and Hebrew words in Bible study and, and sermons. So, Greek words, yeah. all of you who care, raise your right hand. <laughs> Nobody raises their right hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, we're in chapter 14. Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. I'm hoping my battery lasts. i got to remember to change it when I get home. Here we go. We're recording. This is Monday night, March 28th. So we're, our schedule for April is the regular schedule. We, we should be able to meet every week except Monday of Holy Week, which is also council night. You having council that week? Okay, so. So we'll meet next week, but not the week after. And we'll meet two or three weeks after that. Okay, all right. All right, chapter 14. <clears throat> Let's read that first. And then we'll look at at our slides and whatever. <clears throat> All right, so we ended chapter 13 by looking at the number 666. It's a human number, right? Mm -hmm. And we figured most scholars uh, that are being a little bit careful and conservative would uh, recognize it's probably Nero, a reference to Nero. Now, not that he's, because he's, he's dead already. So it's not him, but in the story it fits somebody like him. All right, so 14. Then I looked, and behold, what's the word behold me? There it is. There it is. There was. Pay attention. My, my Greek professor, anytime we found that word, made us say Shazam. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be, then I looked, and Shazam on Mount Zion stood the lamp. Every Time. Every time. Oh, that's good. So, so that's what behold means. Shazam. If you don't know what that means, you have to look it up when you get home. Right. Anyway, then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. Now, now, what's significant about Mount Zion? That's where the Temple Mount is, isn't it? All right, it's in Jerusalem, and it's the Temple Mount. All right. What else? That's where the end time feast is going to be. That's in Isaiah and other prophets. That's where um, God's victories along the way and his final victory. He's going to gather all the nations on Mount Zion. Okay? So this would tell us that there's some idea here of the Lamb standing on the mountain where all the nations will gather in the end times. 
and that's the mountain where God stands with uh, in victory. Right? With him there are 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So they were sealed. Remember chapter 7? They were sealed. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder, which indicates to us that whose voice it is. God's, God's voice, voice, right? <clears throat> the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. So who's singing? God. The 144,000. 144,000. Okay. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. What's redeemed? <coughs> Saved. Bought. 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 Somebody paid for your freedom. <coughs> right? So you are free. Ransomed is a, another word that means about the same thing. All right. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Well, not so much sexually, but in terms of, of um, idolatry. Okay. They've been faithful to God from the beginning. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. All right. Which indicates to us again, too, that it's not about the virgins being sexually pure or unmarried, but rather that their confession is true about the one true God who raised Jesus from the dead. Okay? They are blameless. Right? Well, then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. What does it mean that it's an eternal gospel? Gospel means good news, right? Mm -hmm. So, eternal. Mine says everlasting. Everlasting. Good news. Okay. So it'll last forever. I mean, it's good for all time, right? Mm -hmm. And they will proclaim it to everyone on earth. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So there is a call to repentance. The, the gospel is, God loves you, Jesus died for you, your sins are forgiven, you can have the Holy Spirit. God will be with you, right? I mean, all the, all the stuff we talk about Sunday after Sunday after Sunday okay, to be preached to the world. And so, in a nutshell, it's fear God, give Him glory, right? turn from your idols, because His judgment has come. It's here now. So, worship Him, the Creator. Right? No creatures, no idols, but only the one true God. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And we've not heard about Babylon yet. First indication. We'll get that full story in another couple of chapters. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, or her idolatry, right? Okay. <coughs> okay. She made all the nations drink the wine of the passion. What's passion? We talk about Jesus' passion. Passion is a Latin word that means suffering. Means what? Suffering. Okay. Compassion means, what's the prefix C-O-M mean? With. 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 So, compassion means you suffer with somebody. Their suffering affects you in such a way that you want to and have to do something about it. Okay. Either you walk alongside of them, or you 
find a resolution or you know you you have to do something all right sympathy says oh you poor dear woe is you you know it's what's such bad luck you have isn't that a shame right compassion says how can i help what can i do what do you need from me all right compassion to suffer with somebody all right so if that's what's happening here she made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality does it have something to do with the suffering that people do when they follow a different god the wine of the suffering of her idolatry okay Continuing, and another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath. So not only Satan and the beast and the second beast, you know, the, the, the emperor and the false prophet, right, that unholy trinity, but all those who follow them as well. He will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Because <coughs> they're the ones who are going, who, who get to judge, right? They're the ones who, who get to give out the punishment. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. This, this smoke of their torment goes up and is in contrast with the smoke in the bowls that represent of incense, that represent the prayers of the saints. Okay. This smoke is maybe that smoke is white this smoke is black who knows what color it was smoke is smoke right <laughs> i mean who pays much attention to the color all right usually right okay here is a call for the endurance of the saints gosh he's telling us exactly what this is all about endurance of the saints those who keep the commandments of god and their faith in jesus a call for endurance because we're going to we're going to go through the suffering we're going to go through the tribulation. We're going to go through the world as it is until Jesus comes back. And all along the way, in every generation, it's going to be tough. And the world's going to be out there trying to pull us away from God. And there's going to be all kinds of religions telling us that they're just as good as we are. And all that sort of stuff, right? All this idolatry, all different sorts of gods out there. All right? And it's a call for us to, to be faithful. Okay. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And not only the martyrs, but anyone who dies with faith. All right? So this isn't just martyrs. They didn't die for you know, being Christians. Okay? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Okay? Everybody around this table should be in the Lord, right? In Christ. All right? So, all right? That it's talking about us. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Okay. So we talk about, often, uh, cheap grace, and we, we still have to do good works, right? But the, that's the evidence of our faith. It's not the way we earn our way in, but it's the evidence, okay? So their deeds follow them. The evidence, their labors. It's the evidence of their faith. Okay, Those who die in the Lord have faith. And it's uh, shown by their deeds. Okay. Then the harvest. Then I looked and behold a white cloud. And seated on the cloud one like a son of man. So now everybody's going to think about Daniel 7. With a golden crown on his head. Which means he's king. right? And a sharp sickle in his hand. Which means he used to be a farmer. No, that's not true. <laughs> and another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. 
So he who sat in the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now where else have we ever heard that Jesus would do the harvesting? Nowhere. Trick question. The angels do the harvesting. Jesus doesn't do the harvesting. The crop is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Yep. Okay. So maybe this one who sat on the cloud isn't Jesus. One like the Son of Man, and that usually refers to him, all right, but this, and he's got the golden crown. But who else has golden crown in Revelation? Angels. The 24 elders have crowns? Aren't they wearing crowns? Don't they put them before the throne? Well, they did in one place, yeah. Okay. All right. All right, let's continue, maybe. Maybe we'll learn some more. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire on the altar. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. They're both sharp sickles, right? Mm -hmm. One angel and the other, they both, okay. So which one's he talking to? I don't know. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So who is this angel harvesting? Sinners. Those non-believers. The non-believers. Okay. All right. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia or 184 miles. What city is 184 miles from here? From here? Yeah. Let me just have some idea of the distance we're talking about. Washington, D.C. No. I don't know. I don't know. No. I don't know. Oh, I, here, I thought either. you knew the answer. Nope, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> 184 miles. miles. Give or take a couple, you know. Probably Raleigh. Yeah. Almost to the beach. Three hours. Right. Yeah, three hours away. Okay. 200 to Myrtle Beach. About 225 to the beach. 250. So it's less than that. Right. Anyway, it gives you an idea of, of, yeah. of yeah. about how it's far we through. might be talking. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. It's now, <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. And in the wine press, what's in the wine press? Right, yeah, okay, they, they gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, okay, and they were thrown into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The winepress was trodden outside the city, which is where criminals and others were crucified. Right? The blood flowed <coughs> as high. So the blood, the, the juice of the grapes is called the blood of the grape. Mm -hmm. Right, that's no big deal, all right. Um, high as a horse's bridle. That's a lot of blood. But <laughs> well, it's a lot of juice. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of juice. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at our slides and see if we can make a little more sense. Okay. <clears throat> the Lamb holds the high ground, Mount Zion, where the redeemed gather and will gather. All right. Okay. Virgins are the ones who follow the Lamb. They reject adversaries the adversaries practices okay. they remained faithful to Jesus okay soldiers um, would abstain from intercourse during when they were at war in battle even if they were close to home how many of you remember that part in the story of David and Bathsheba when he finds out she's pregnant and he calls and brings Uriah her husband home from the battle and there's also other soldiers there Okay. And he says, you know, why don't you go see Bathsheba? Okay. He says, no, I can't. We're in the middle of the battle. So he sleeps with the soldiers, right? Because okay. that was the custom. Right. <coughs> Oops, don't do that. Um, there are earlier references in, in uh, Revelation about fornication in chapter 2, adultery in chapter 2, and the unclean in chapter 3. Okay. 
Sexual infidelity leads to violence and oppression and greed. Okay, Let's see what's in 17, 1 to 6. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and says, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. Okay. So the prostitute would be the one who wants to tease people away from being faithful to their spouses, right? Okay. Right. So there's a lot of violence and oppression and greed in, in 17 and 18, and we'll get to that um, I doubt tonight, but next week. The faithful are the first first fruits of the harvest of the earth. Okay, so the harvest is, of the whole earth um, is happens on Judgment Day, the second coming, all right, Resurrection Day. All right. So it's one day of salvation for the faithful, and it's a day of judgment for the unbelievers. All right. So the messages of the three angels in verses six to thirteen. The first angel. Um, they give one last call to repentance and belief in the eternal gospel. The good news is for all people and for all time. God's call is for conversion rather than destruction. Okay. That's one of the things we've been driving home, right, in this whole book. There's another call to repentance, another call to repentance, because God does not desire the death of the wicked. Didn't we have that in the, one of our lessons the last two weeks? God does not desire the death of the wicked, but that they should turn from their sin, from their wickedness, and live. So, if that's true, then we have to read what we already know about God into this last book. Okay. So, he's given everybody a one last chance before Judgment Day. Right? <clears throat> Babylon is fallen, says the second angel. This is the first mention of Babylon, which is a symbol of the powers and people who work against God and his people. Well, remember that the Babylonians were the ones who destroyed the first temple in 587, okay, and took over Jerusalem, okay, so and ever since, and took the people into exile. <clears throat> so ever since, Babylon is that symbolic name of any power that works against God and his people, okay. Third angel, as the smoke of the torment of the damned, damned people, rises before the host of heaven, it is the counterpart to the prayers of the saints that rise as incense to God's throne. And to those who endure, they receive a promise of rest. What is rest? <clears throat> a renewal. A time to renew. Okay. A break from work. A break from work. You stop working, right? Peace. Peace. No worries, no frets. You're able to relax, right? Okay. What keeps you awake? We've talked about this before. What keeps you awake when you want to sleep but can't? Keep. Why can't you go to sleep? Worry. You got too much worry. Worry, worry about head. what? You got too much what? Running through your head. Okay, stuff about, like uh, about what? Unfinished work. Okay. Unfinished work. All right. Dangers. Dangers. Okay. Did you lock the doors? Yeah. Did you lock the door? When we were first married, Kathy used to we crawl into bed, and she say, "Did you lock the door?" Would you ask me that before I crawled into bed? She <laughs> would <laughs> wait. Nope, it's your turn. <laughs> I suddenly went blind. You'll have to do it. <laughs> I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> if we're bugged about something, you know, we just it, we just can't let it go. Right? We can't sleep. If we're hungry, we can't sleep. If we're thirsty, we can't sleep. Hmm? If we're not feeling well, we can't sleep usually, right? Okay. So we need to be free from all of those worries in order to relax and go to sleep. Because I got nothing to worry about, right? Okay. And you set your alarm if you have to get up at a certain time, just in case. Right. 
But once you set your alarm, you don't even have to worry about that. The alarm will go off. You'll hear it. You'll get up and do what you have to do. Maybe. <laughs> I do it that way. Okay. There's a snooze on it. I don't worry about nothing. <laughs> All right. The harvest of the earth. <clears throat> there are two harvests. First, the children of God, the faithful, are harvested like grain, the bread of life. The second harvest are the wicked. They are harvested and crushed like grapes in the wine press of the wrath. Or the judgment of God. Salvation and judgment come from the one like a son of man on the clouds. Okay. Golden crown on his head, a sharp sickle in his hand. Okay. And that's his life. So it's, it's not really Jesus, but someone. Well, like one, him. one of the things that, that always uh, is, is part of the language describing God, it's we, we don't ever see him. We don't know what he looks like. Right. So the best we can do here in seeing Jesus is he's like the Son of Man. He, he's got that kind of form, but we really can't see what he looks like. So all we can say is you know, he looks like a human. He's got a crown on his head. That tells us who it is. Okay. And what he's going to do is it's time for the... Time for the harvest. Okay. So Jesus comes to get his own. The other angel picks up the wicked. Sounds like, right? Okay. Questions about 14? <coughs> Chapter 14? In 13, we had, we had heard about the, the two beasts. And the number of the beast and uh, all the harm that they were doing and then there's kind of an interlude here where we get a picture of the of the harvest the final judgment the believers 144,000 are on Mount Zion the, the the place where God will call all the faithful at at the end and they will gather in his presence right so there's that short picture of uh, of victory and first fruits and of the redeemed so that's a, a little pause and uh, and they're singing to God right so that's a good scene and then the angels talk about one last time to repent here's the eternal gospel turn to God give him glory because the hour of judgment's coming right and then we hear about the uh, about the harvest so chapter 14 gives us kind of that an, another inter interlude where we get a picture of uh, the saints at rest with joy singing to God and the judgment comes, the harvest of the earth, all right? But of course, that's not the end, right? Because the book continues. <laughs> okay, all right. Remember all the old movies? What happened when the movie was over? It, yeah, yeah. I told you it was over. It's at the end. <laughs> they don't do that in movies anymore. No. Okay? They don't. But in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s mm -hmm. even, I think, you know, the end. They told you it was over. Okay? All right. Chapter 15. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the seven angels and seven plagues. So let's look, continue looking at our slides here for, for uh, a couple of these. The seven angels with seven plagues. These are the last, for with these the wrath of God is finished. So here we get an idea that this is the last call for repentance. Right? We return to the throne room with its floor like a sea of glass from the vision in chapter 4, I think. Right? The song is about God's deliverance through Moses and the Lamb. Um, <clears throat> we'll remember a lot of things that happened in Exodus with the plagues and, uh, and the departure of the Israelites across the Red Sea and into the, into the wilderness. Okay. God is king of the nations and the nations are converted. Right? Some Old Testament references, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 86 and 111 and 139 and 145 and Jeremiah 10. 
chapter 15. A, there's a stately liturgical procession that takes place. Seven angels appear dressed like priests with golden sashes like the Son of Man in chapter 1 verse 13. They are met by the four living creatures who, instead of lifting up prayers, now the bowls bear the wrath that will be poured out on the earth. The temple is filled with smoke from the power and glory of God, and the angels will not return until they have finished their task. All right, so let's read chapter 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, not plaques. <laughs> plaques is with a Q, plagues is with a G, all right, which are the last, for with them... The wrath of God is finished. Now, for us, that's good news. It's like, get on with it, okay? We're ready for salvation, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. So, all right, so first you got a sea of glass, right? Mingled with fire says, it looks like there's fire inside, right? Um, so, sometimes we get gems and stones, and once they get cut and polished... You know, they look like they've got something inside. Okay? Like a, a cat's eye. And if you, those of you that played marbles when you were younger, okay, you get a cat, okay? It, it's a piece of glass. Clear, but it looks like it's got a cat's eye inside, right? So this glass just looks like it's got fire inside. It's whatever sort of gem or stone polish that it is, okay? And also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. All right? So who is it that's conquered? Who is it that God tells, you know, to those who conquer? Who does he say that to? Those that have served him or, or those that believed in him and followed the, the task. Okay. Yes, and where are they from? Remember the letters to the churches in the beginning? Mm -hmm. And every one of those, to so those who conquer, they will give, and then, you know, depending on what they needed. Okay? So, these who have conquered are those who responded, those in the church who, who heard the letters, who remained, who did remain faithful, okay? They conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. So they were standing there with harps of God and their plan. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So they're singing two songs. One written by Moses, one written by Jesus. Okay. And here it is. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Okay. So people from every nation will be there. Not everybody from all the nations, but people from all the nations will be there. After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And what does that remind us of? The tent of witness, the tent of meeting in the in the tabernacle as they went through the wilderness okay <clears throat> it was opened which means the door's not shut the curtain's not pulled it means we can go in and out and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests and one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever and the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished so it's like okay everybody stay in your places the angels are going to do their thing and when they're done they will continue okay all right so when you read this kind of stuff and all the normal stuff in the Bible, sometimes you have to stop and, and, and picture this. When, when I read almost anything that's got some action in it and, and characters, um, I, I make a movie in my head. I picture it all the time. Okay. 
Um, and it's probably a whole lot different from the way you would picture it, but it's my movie. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, again, you have to, to picture, okay, the, um, the, the, the sanctuary of the tent of witness was opened, right? So the, the curtain is separated. Out of the sanctuary come the seven angels with seven plagues. They're clothed in pure, bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. Right? That's from back in chapter 1. Okay. One of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. Are these angels happy angels? What kind of expression they have on their face? Are they just kind of neutral? I'm, you know, I'm just doing what God tells me to do. I'm just following orders. Are they sad or are they, you know, what's what's going on with them? I don't know. I'm just asking. I think if they okay. were angels, they'd be sad they had to get the plagues out. Maybe. Okay. Have okay. Right. Okay. And yet they know why no, they have to yes, do it. But mm -hmm. they know that's and it's, again, one last call to repentance. Right. <laughs> so they ought to be hopeful. Somebody is going to turn from their wickedness and come back to God. Okay. At least we hope. <clears throat> okay. And then the picture of God. That Boy, we can't... I have a question. Who's one of the four living beings? One of the four living creatures. Remember, we had four living creatures at the start. We had twenty-four elders on the on their own thrones. Okay. We had four living creatures. Okay. All right. So one of them. Okay, but it doesn't tell you which one. Nope. Okay. Nope. Okay. Right. And that's and all those kind of questions are good to ask. You might not get an answer. Like we don't know which one. Okay. So and that's okay. fine. Okay. But one of those guys. Okay. Or whatever it is. Okay. Um, creatures. <laughs> And it doesn't hurt, especially in a book like this, to go back and say, I need to remind myself about the four living creatures. Okay. Because they all had different faces. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is a majestic scene. The, the, the smoke fills the sanctuary because of the glory and power of God. I mean, imagine what that would be like. Okay. And why smoke? I don't know. Do you know? Hmm. I mean, God chose the pillar of cloud, you know, to, to yeah. lead his people. That's the only, that's the first yeah. thing that comes to my mind. Yeah. But, yeah. Then when he met with Moses, it was, you know, the, the cloud came yeah. down on yeah. the top of the yeah. mountain and on the tent of meeting. So it was like, you're not going to be able to see me in all my glory. I've got to put up a smoke screen. Because mm -hmm. okay. even when Moses said, let me see you. I want to see who I'm talking to. You can see me, but only my backside. You can't see my face because nobody can see God's full glory and live. Right? So he puts him in that crack in the rock and holds his hand over him and until he passes by. He moves his hand. And even then, Moses comes down the mountain and the glory of God just still reflects off his face. He's got to wear a veil for, I don't forget how long it was. <coughs> Any thoughts or questions about chapter 15? All right, let's continue with our slides then. I'm not sure if I missed anything. No, it's a short one, only eight verses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chapter 16 then. Seven bowls of God's wrath. Mm -hmm. The fun. The party is just beginning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. The first four trumpets and the first four bowls. So remember the trumpets. And the first four bowls bring plagues upon the earth, the sea, the inland waters, and the sun. The fifth trumpet and the fifth bowl deal with the destroyer and the beast. The sixth trumpet and bowl portray hostile armies gathering near the Euphrates River. So again, there's a parallel between the trumpets and the bowls. So we're hearing the same story, only from a different perspective or with a different emphasis, right? This repetitive character of the visions shows that we are not dealing with the timeline or sequence of events. So it's so the 
bowls don't come after the trumpets, don't come after the seals. The seven seals, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, in the story they do. I mean, in the book, okay, we read about one first and then the other. But they're telling the same story. The book repeats a similar message of warning in multiple ways. A message of repentance and commitment to the ways of God and the Lamb. The bold plagues give a picture of more complete judgment on the worshippers of the beast, designed to strip away the reader's sense of security by hemming them in with dangers on earth, sea, and sky. Remember the letters to the churches and how God warned them all to repent. Right? All but two. two. Two of the churches were doing just fine. Okay? And two of the churches had nothing good said about them. But there was a call to repentance. Right? So even the churches, the Christians, needed to be careful. And that's why from time to time we're told... Um, this is a call for the endurance of the saints. Right? Okay. And the purpose of repentance is to bring people back to God to receive his forgiveness, mercy, and restoration. Right? The first bowl, the beast is killed, or I'm sorry, the beast killed those who would not bow and worship him. However, God's mercy only sends, I mean, in God's mercy, he doesn't turn around and kill the beast who killed God's children. He is merciful, even though there's that text that says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for life. Okay. God only sends a foul and painful sore. I mean, bad enough, but he doesn't kill him. Right? Exodus 9, verses 10 and 11, um, is, that's where we find that same uh, plague. With hopes for last-minute repentance. All right, so let's read chapter 16. <clears throat> then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out. He could have said, Go and sprinkle. <laughs> Right? But he's not Lutheran. <laughs> 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 he's not Lutheran. He pours, right? God pours. He doesn't spritz or sprinkle or drip. He pours. Even in judgment, right? Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God, the judgment of God. Okay. Now, all right, let's. Most of the time when we hear the word wrath, we think of anger, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's wrathful. We say, "Oh, they just—they're just so angry, all right?" But wrath is judgment. You can make a judgment, carry out judgment without being angry. Okay. So, what are some other? I mean, I'm sure God is angry, but what are some other emotions that would go along with this? What other emotions might God be feeling? <coughs> well, in the last chapter, that word that we read is passion. It's the same Greek word as wrath. So okay. Suffering. Right. Could be disappointment because nobody's obeying or doing what he wants them to do. Right. He's Give disappointed them a chance not only after chance, and they they didn't they, take it. They refuse to repent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So he's disappointed. What would go along with that for those of you that are parents Sadness. and want to bless your kids and they won't let you? Sadness. Mm -hmm. Anger. Disappointment. Anger. Disappointment. Mm -hmm. Frustration. Okay. And he's got a broken heart too, I'll bet. Okay. Like at the flood, when he decided, you know, he was going to have to destroy the whole human race, it says it grieved God to his heart. His heart was broken. He was sorry he made man that way. But he did make the best of all possible worlds. We just made the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, it wasn't his fault. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So, the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. 
and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Now, if we drew a, if we made a cartoon of this, an animated feature, all right, okay, we'd have this angel with a with a, with a huge bowl, okay, yeah. and he pours out the bowl on the earth, and then and then when whatever comes out of the bowl, whatever is, is actually poured out, okay, when it touches the people, they're gonna all of a sudden they're gonna have sores all over their bodies and they're going to say oh well this, this hurts okay. right <laughs> go see the call the doctor right okay. came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image it didn't harm the Christians which is the way it was in Egypt mm -hmm. the plagues harmed the Egyptians did not mm -hmm. harm the Israelites now because the Egyptians were a mess I'm sure they took it out on the Israelites. So it's not that the Israelites didn't suffer because of the plagues, but they didn't suffer the plagues. All right? Okay. All right. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse. What's that like? Like the Nile turning to blood. After you died, doesn't your blood kind of turn to or? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would think I that okay. the blood of a corpse is not running. Is it darker? No, no it's room. darker. Okay, but I like that. It's not the blood of a corpse isn't running. All right, so maybe, you know, maybe the seed stopped. Collaborate. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I ask these questions. I, I don't know that there's an answer. I don't know what's important to ask. Yeah. But as you read the Bible, you need to stop and not just read these words and keep on going, but stop and say, what does that mean? Okay. That's your movie again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. It became like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. Every living thing in the sea so don't go swimming that day <laughs> the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water so the first one went to the first bowl went out on the people the unbelievers the second bowl goes to the salt water the third bowl is poured out on the fresh water and they become blood, which is also what happened in Egypt. Okay. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was. Notice there's no and is to come, because he has come. He is here, carrying out his wrath. Right? For you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. A lot of people don't like this little <coughs> thing. Because it should be, this isn't the God they like. Right? They want God to be merciful and forgiving all the time. They don't, you know, it's what they deserve. But you see, two things to remember. One is, God is the creator, and he's the boss, and he gets to say what's what. And the end is here. There is no more time after this. It's, it's eternity with him or without him. <coughs> there is, time is up. The judgment is being poured out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like you, you've time, had you, how many? You, yes, right. How you, many times you. have you realized that you're you're not in control? That God is the one that's in control. You can't be your own little god, and the gods that you worship aren't helping you. So turn to the one true God. He's simply trying to show you that He's in control, and if you turn to Him, He'll forgive you, and restore you, and bless you. Right? I mean, that's the eternal gospel, right? Let's read that song. Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed, they, the unbelievers, have shed the blood of saints and prophets. 
So now that's kind of an answer to to the uh, martyrs under the altar in chapter 5. How long before you avenge our blood on those who are on the earth? Here it is. It's happening. You have given them blood to drink. They were drinking the blood of the saints. Now they'll drink the blood of judgment. It is what they deserve. And then I heard the altar saying. Now we have a talking altar. <laughs> Go back to your animated you know, movie. Okay. Yeah, yes. Lord God the Almighty. True and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. And it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. What does it take? <laughs> well, for some people, it, it, they'll never, they'll never. Okay. But we can't ever quit praying or witnessing because they have till the day they die. And who knows if on that 11th hour they might just realize, sorry, we just have to keep. Right? <clears throat> and But this is the 11th hour. This is, time is up. There is no more time. Okay. It's now or never, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And its kingdom was plunged into darkness. Notice he doesn't kill the beast. Mm -hmm. Even though this is the final judgment scene with all this stuff happening. You know, again, one last opportunity to repent. Okay. So he's plunged into darkness. Maybe the beast. Now who's the beast? It's Satan. not Satan. Satan's the dragon. So the beast is a human. Is that false and prophet? Well, the false prophet is one beast from the sea, and the other beast is from the land. So you've got the emperor and the priest. So you've got the, the human leader of the kingdoms, okay? And then you've got the, the, those who keep trying to, to convince the people. You have the advertisers who are keep trying to convince you that you need to worship the beast. Okay. The, okay. So even here, he's trying to give the beast... A chance to repent. Its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. See, again, when we, when things get really bad, we have two choices. We either do what these people did. They curse God. God, if this is the way you're going to treat me, leave me alone. Go away. Ignore me. Make believe I'm not here. Make believe you don't know me. Okay, Leave me alone. Or you run to God and say, I don't know what you're doing, but i got nowhere else to go. Please help. Right? Those are our two choices. There isn't a third choice. Because if you don't run to God, you're running somewhere else. Say, God, leave me alone. I'll get my help somewhere else. Or I got myself into this mess. I'll get myself out of it. Right? All those sorts of things. You know, it's still the second choice. There are no third and fourth choices. <coughs> the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. So now some of the kings are going to bring their armies, right? And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, was, there we have our unholy trinity, right? three unclean spirits like frogs. Yeah, tell me John doesn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> right? Okay. Now we also had the plague of frogs yeah. in Egypt. Okay. And as we recall, Moses made frogs and then the magicians made, made more, more frogs. frogs. Yeah. How frogs. stupid are they? <laughs> All right. But so now the unholy trinity, okay, unclean spirits like frogs. Frogs were considered unclean, so these spirits also are unclean, for they are demonic spirits. So what does that tell you, that they're demonic? What does that make you think of? When Be bad or uh, to get back at or what? You mean? Devilish. devilish. Right, they're mean, devilish. Okay. They're against Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
they answer to Satan, right? Mm -hmm. okay. They are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. So they're going to assemble them. They say, we got to put out one last big battle against God. Okay. Now, how's the victory won all along the way? What are we reminded of over and over? The victory is won through the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. And the testimony that the Christians give about Jesus. Right? The blood and their testimony. So this battle is a battle of words and truth. It's not a battle of hand grenades and bazookas. As much fun as that would be. Okay? All right. And then God says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Which means you won't know when I'm coming. Okay? I'm going to surprise you. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Okay. You have your Greek open? Yeah. Um, I think it's Har Megiddo. Har is the word for mountain. H-A-R means mountain. And Megiddo. Okay. Armageddon. Okay. Um, Megiddo... Let's see if I got that. Um, on the says Armageddon slash the mountain of Megiddo. The mountain of Megiddo, okay, Megiddo, Megiddo whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, they can spell it three or four different ways, I guess. Yeah. Har, Har, Armageddon, okay. Armageddon. Okay. Yeah. So is the mountain of Megiddo a place? Yeah, there is a place in Israel yeah. called, okay. called Megiddo. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Go to slide 143. That's it. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, 44. I keep forgetting we're one off. Armageddon. The battle is described in chapter 19. It's Har is is the Greek word for mountain. Maybe I have it on slide. Magadon. Okay. Megiddo, which is actually on a plane. It's not. On a mountain, the, mm, the yeah. okay, the Megiddo. So, so again, this, you know, Armageddon, the mountain of Megadon, is not the real place because the real place is on a plane. It's not on a mountain. Mm. Right. So again, it's symbolic. So we have to ask the question: What has happened at Megiddo over the centuries? Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> So there's a symbolic use, like we've seen already, <clears throat> nicknames for idolatry. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Are Balak, Balaam, Jezebel, Jerusalem is called Sodom in Egypt. Rome is called Babylon. All right. So we have to ask, in what way is Megiddo uh, symbolized for us? What what is it? What should it make us think of? Right. Old Testament references to Megiddo are linked to battles where Israel is victorious. Okay, so let's look at those. Judges chapter 5, verse 19. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Judges. What? Matthew, Mark, Luke, Joshua, Judges? That's good. <laughs> judges chapter 5. <laughs> Get you every time. By verse 19. <clears throat> it's poetry. The kings came. <clears throat> they fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan at Taanak by the waters of Megiddo. They got no spoils of silver. Right? You can't have spoils if you don't win the war, right? So they lost the war. <clears throat> From heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon. March on, my soul, with might. All right. So there's one place where they're reminded, okay, as they recount. 
This is the song of Deborah and Barak. Okay, after they had won a war battle at Megiddo. Okay. Um, Second Chronicles thirty five. Second Chronicles comes after First Chronicles. So all the help I'm going to give you. Chapter 35, verse 22. <clears throat> 35. Second Chronicles 35, verse 22. So Josiah is killed in this battle, but even though the king is killed, the Israelites still win the battle. Okay. Right. Starting at verse 22. Now let's start. Let's read it at 20. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, went up to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates, and Josiah went out to meet him. But he sent envoys to him saying what have we to do with each other king of judah i am not coming against you this day but against the house with which i am at war and god has commanded me to hurry see supposing god who is with me lest he destroy you nevertheless josiah did not turn away from him but disguised himself in order to fight with him he did not listen to the words of necho from the mouth of god so even God can speak through right, non-Israelites and, and non-Christians and all. But he came to fight in the plain of Megiddo. And the archers shot King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Take me away, for I am badly wounded. The servants took him out of the chariot, carried him in his second chariot, <coughs> and brought him to Jerusalem. And he died and was buried in the tombs of his fathers. All Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah, and all the singing men and women have spoken of Josiah in their laments. They made these a rule in Israel. <clears throat> Behold, they are written in the laments. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and his good deeds, etc., etc., etc. Okay, right, well, where are we going to learn that we won the battle? Josiah. Judas decline. Then it goes on to Judas decline. I thought they were going to tell us who we won the battle, which we did, but. I don't know, my, the, hit, or the hitting of mine says defeat by Pharaoh. And that's what you thought. And Second chariot. Anybody got any idea? Um, well, uh, yeah, because it, it's Megiddo is is linked to battles where Israel's victorious. But Nico wasn't wanting to fight with the Israelites. He was wanting to fight the Assyrians. Yeah, he was trying to fight someone else. Yeah, and he was telling the king of Assyria, you know, God, yeah. God doesn't said, want you in the battle. You should stay yeah, home. Stay he wasn't home. fighting. It didn't sound like he was fighting all of Judah, just certain people. But he didn't listen. Then he got killed. The house of which I am at war. Here, let me read the paragraph that, that this slide is based on. What does the name Megiddo signify? Old Testament references. Oops, let me turn this back on. Um, 
Old Testament references to Megiddo often link it to battles in which the adversaries of Israel are defeated. In Judges 5.19, Megiddo is associated with Deborah's victory over Israel's foes. The battle was won when God sent rain from heaven so that the Canaanite chariots were bogged down in the mud and the Canaanite army was routed. In 2 Chronicles 35.22, King Josiah of Judah was killed near Megiddo. Although he was a good king, this text says that he was killed because he would not listen to the word of the Lord through Nico, Nico right? um, so that his fate serves as a warning to all who refuse to heed God. Finally, in Zechariah 12, verse 11, um, that announces the coming day of the Lord's victory, mentioning Megiddo as the place where worshippers of a pagan god mourn. Taken together, the association suggests that Megiddo is a place name that portends the coming destruction of the adversaries of God. All right, so that's what we're okay. And Second Chronicles thirty-five is to be compared to Second Kings nine twenty-seven. So maybe there's something there. Let's look at Second Kings nine twenty-seven. So back up to book. Second Kings nine twenty-seven. And, and again, this is a, a good illustration of um, if you don't know the, the Bible history, you're going to miss the, the reference or the symbolism of Megiddo, Armaged you know, Armageddon, all right, the mountain of Megiddo. And you won't know, you know, unless you read it in a book or you read some notes, you know, <coughs> Megiddo was on a plane. It wasn't a mountain. So you can't take it literally because there is no mountain of Megiddo. It's a plane. It's a plane, right? So, okay, then for all those who want to take a lot of this stuff literally, it's like, well, I'm sorry, it doesn't work. So, chapter 9, verse 27, 27, 2 Kings 27. When Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled in the direction of Beth Hagan, and Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him also. And they shot him in the chariot at the ascent of Gur, which is by Ibliam, and he fled to Megiddo and died there. His servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb with his fathers in the city of David. So King Ahaziah okay, died at Megiddo. Now that sounds like the Israelites lost. It's just that the king died there. Okay. But should have. So there. So King Je Josiah and King Ahaziah both died in battle at Megiddo. All right. Okay. Then Zechariah 12, that's near the end of the Old Testament. So Matthew, Mark, Zechariah. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> Zechariah 12 11. It's the next to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah 12 11. Right before Malachi. Or as we used to say, Malachi. <laughs> Zechariah 12 11 says something like Let's start at 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace. And pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only <coughs> child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the mourning, M-O-U-R-N, the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning for Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, etc., etc., by themselves. Okay. On that day. Okay. But before any battle occurs, so now back to the slide. Before any battle occurs, the seventh bowl. So let's read the seventh bowl, Revelation 16, verse 17. 
The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, So who speaks from the throne? God. God and the Lamb. A loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. It is finished. Now that was a cry of acclamation. It wasn't, it wasn't, boy, am I glad this is over. <laughs> right? Okay. It's, the job is completed. I have done everything my father asked me to do. I died for the people. It's done. They have been redeemed. The devil is defeated. Okay? He doesn't know it yet. Okay? Because I'm not raised from the dead, but, right? Job is done. It's finished. So, he's getting excited. Okay? Besides his pain, it's going to be over. <laughs> okay? All right. All right. Um, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake. Again, that takes us back to Exodus when God would show up, right? Such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. Why is this the biggest earthquake? Because this is the final judgment. It's over. This is done. The great city. Okay, now what's the difference between the great city and the holy city? Great city is Jerusalem. Great city is Jerusalem. The holy city is? Zion. Zion. The new Jerusalem. The church. The church. The, church. the great city is Jerusalem, also known as Sodom and Egypt. Okay. Because they have given in to the idolatry. Okay. The great city was split into three parts, and the <coughs> cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the Great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. So that it's drained means they drink every drop. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. Okay. This, is, um, this is it. Okay. In my Bible here, um, where you were doing about Armageddon, it says, Armageddon has been the site of many military struggles in Israel's history. Some historians estimate more wars have been fought here on that plain than any other location in the world. It is an appropriate setting or symbol for the final struggle between good and evil. Okay. And you usually don't fight battles in the mountains, right? Right. I mean, I mean guerrilla warfare and all that sort of stuff, right? But it, it's... Not an easy place to fight a war. You usually, you know, you line up on either side of the meadow and you march toward each other. Right? In in the days when, when bullets didn't go so far, like in the Civil War, we went, Kathy and I went to one of the reenactments and the Union Army was on this end of the meadow and the uh, Confederate Army was at the other end of the meadow having lunch. <laughs> smoking their pipes and eating lunch and yelling and talking to each other I mean not they weren't taking a break from their reenactment during the re they were they could talk to each other but the bullets wouldn't go that far so they were safe they were in a yeah. safe zone yeah. but they were it we could stand at the fence and see, see, both sides. see you know, both ends of the meadow. You, know? you missed me. <laughs> Which is why one of the first battles in the Civil War, they, yeah. people did yeah. come out to watch from a distance. Yeah. And could yeah. safely do that. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. But. Yeah. You'd think with the war, you always think. Well, I mean, they yeah. thought it was only going to last a couple of weeks. So mm -hmm. Well, and, and again, it's why you don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Right. You know, because then, then they're close enough and, and you have a pretty good chance of hitting them. But until then, who knows what you're going to hit or if it's even going to reach them, right? Mm -hmm. well, well, weapons are coming along. They shoot and he goes out the end of the gun, drops mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. Lead yeah. bullets. Yeah. Yeah, they're heavy. So, how many of you saw the movie Gettysburg? Give you a whole, it's an amazing movie, give you a whole new idea of what war was like when you actually saw your enemy. 
up close and personal. Right, close up and close and personal. personal. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Glory's pretty good about showing that too. I, think. I didn't see that one. Yeah, that's, that's what I've heard though. You, you know what it's about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little bit in Cold Mountain too, when they show some of the battles and the yeah. trenches and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You can see it how close they were. And I guess even World War One when they were close for the mm -hmm. trenches when they're coming out. Yeah. All right, so let's look at our slides. Um, so we did, let's see, we missed, let's back up before Armageddon to, um, back to the bowls. Yeah, uh, we did slide 140, let's do 141. <laughs> the bowl plagues give a picture of more complete judgment on the worshipers of the beast. Designed to strip away the readers, the you know, people who read the book of Revelation, the reader's sense of security by hemming them in with dangers in earth, sea, and sky. We read this already, right? Mm -hmm. The purpose of repentance is to bring people back. The first bowl, the beast killed those who would not bow and worship him. However, God's mercy only sends a foul and painful sore with hopes for last minute repentance. The second bowl, Salt waters are turned to blood and everything in the sea perishes. Why do the innocent creatures die? No answer is given. Why do the ungodly survive? They need a chance to repent still. Okay? I mean, we, God's grace and mercy. If we all got what we deserved, we'd all be miserable. Even us believers, right? So grace is good. Third bowl, the fresh waters are turned to blood. In chapter 16, verse 6, given them blood to drink, it's what they deserve. They are not killed. Again, God's merciful judgment in verse 7. The fourth bowl, the sun brings fierce heat, but does not kill. The worshipers of the beast choose to worship it and refuse to repent and to glorify God. They choose to worship the sun, right? I mean, that's one of their gods. The sun, the moon, the stars, and, and all that. So if the, if the sun gets really hot like that, and they're worshiping the sun, they would say, our God must be mad at us because he's, you know, he's burning us up. He's giving us all sunburn. <laughs> right? The fifth bowl. Divine wrath on the throne of the beast whose kingdom is engulfed in darkness. Compare Exodus chapter 10. That was one of the plagues then, too, darkness. They refuse to repent and show they are fully allied with the beast. So they can heal up from all the sun that they got. Yeah, yeah. They got the darkness they wanted. or I mean, they didn't want the heat and the sun, so then they got the darkness. The sixth bowl, Euphrates, dries up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. The Persians defeated the Babylonians and allowed the Jews to return to Judea back in the 500s BC or the late 400s. I'm sorry, the late, oh, I can't count backwards. The temple was rededicated in 515 BC. So yeah, so in the, in the, um, middle to late 500 okay which would be from 500 to 550 BC okay it was when that happened right the Romans are fearful <coughs> of the Parthians in the east and show the vulnerability of the powers that oppress God's people so the Romans the Greeks the Babylonians, the Assyrians, all those. Okay, eventually, they met their demise because they they oppose God and His people, and God is the ruler of all the nations, and so He replaces one empire with another. The beast and its allies respond negatively, intensifying their opposition. Right? Sometimes it happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we had the Armageddon. <coughs> so the seventh bowl. Wrath is uh, poured into the air, unleashing the lightning, the thunder, the hundred-pound hailstones, and a voice from the throne. 
it is done. An earthquake shatters Babylon, or Rome, and the cities of the world collapse. Mountains and islands vanish, and they still refuse to repent. I mean, if you saw, you know, the place leveled, you know, I mean, it's, it's like, no, no, no. You know, I mean, if you know, the place as you know it is just completely changed, it's like, I suppose God is doing something. Maybe we should respond somehow. Hmm? Okay. Well, then John describes the grandeur of the city in chapter 17, destroyed by fire in verse 16, chapter 17, verse 16. Then there is lamenting in chapter 18. Okay. All right. We are going to um, do a little preview here with this chart of the two women in chapter 12. We remember Mary, you know, the church giving birth to the Messiah. The dragon tries to get ready to eat the child or you know, kill the child. And remember that, okay? Well, in chapter 17, we have the great prostitute and the beast. So we'll look at this chart here real quick. All right, so to comp chapter 12 is on the left, chapter 17 on the right. In chapter 12, the woman who is representative of Mary, the mother of Jesus, but also Israel, who gives birth to the Messiah, clothed with the Son and is the mother of the Messiah and the faithful. We'll just go right down that list. She is pursued by a seven-headed monster. Um, she is a noble example of virtue and faithfulness and provision. She flees to the wilderness where God protects her. Okay, you remember that? Mm -hmm. All right. Now in chapter 17, with this great prostitute who rides a beast, she's clothed in scarlet and is the mother of whores and of earth's abominations. So instead of being holy and faithful, she's quite the opposite. Right? She happily rides a seven-headed monster and drinks the blood of the saints. She is a pretentious lady and is a contemptible buffoon. <laughs> okay. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but we'll get the picture of okay. right. um, So, cozy up to the prostitute and her pet beast, which turns around and eats her or destroys her. Okay, so. Um, so, here, so, here's the question. We have five minutes. Um, before we have to quit, do you want to begin to read about the great prostitute and the beast, or do you want to stop here and pick up there next week? Well, let's begin to read. Won't hurt us, I guess. Okay, chapter seventeen. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, we don't know which one, and uh, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, idolatry, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. So all those unbelievers who have given in to the idolatry and just... Be, uh, you know, become drunk on, you know, just doing bad all, things. Yeah, just all the fun they were having doing bad things, right? And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. <clears throat> so the beast, right, it's not the. It, we don't know if it's the emperor, you know, the, one of those other two beasts, or the false prophet, or how they relate yet. Okay. Okay. Had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, very rich, costly um, uh, materials, and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Okay. 
So she represents on this beast, okay, um, oh, as, as was true in those ancient days, they had many goddesses as well as gods. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so she's representing, along with the beast, Babylon, the, all the empires and nations and peoples who, who oppose God. And she's been having fun killing and destroying the church. Okay. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. All right, so the beast was, is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Who, 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 so who comes from the bottomless pit? The devil. The, the devil Sam. and his demons, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast. Because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. That's Rome. The city of seven the hills. City of seven hills. Okay. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. So the woman represents some sort of high up official or influential person in Rome in the empire. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he does come, he must remain only a little while. We're not sure what all that means. People have done all kinds of things to figure out which line of emperors in the Roman Empire these might refer to. Nothing fits. I mean, really well, okay? As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. It's like, what? <laughs> and the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. Now, one hour just says, for a very short time. Okay, like the, the tribulation was for three and a half years. Okay, it, it was, it was going to be a while. Okay. This is for one hour. It's, don't worry about them. They're not going to be there very long. Okay. Um, these are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. So they give all their power of whatever territories and peoples they're in control of over to the empire. Right? And what did Rome do? They went over and conquered all kinds of people, and, the, and those little kings had to give in to the big emperor. <laughs> they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay. Well, there, we know who's going to win the war. Okay. All right, so it wasn't that fun. We'll make more <coughs> sense of that next week, but our time is up. All right. Okay. So. So we've got 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. We have five more chapters to do, to do. So there's a good chance we can get this done in two weeks. Okay, two more classes. All right. okay. But certainly by the end of April. Okay, all right. Um, think about what you might want to do uh, next. Um, uh, Pastor Todd has some ideas. Um, so I might take a break. But can do something with you or whatever. We'll talk about that besides. Um, Still look for new ideas, though. You know, yeah, yeah. So, um, if any of this brought up, what I what I hope happens in Bible studies is that some of the stuff we talked about along the way raises questions for you. Um, and if we made reference to a lot of other scriptures, you might say, "Well, let's look at that book because we we kept mentioning that a lot or something." So let's mm -hmm. look at that or this whole idea. I mean, you, you can always do um, topics, you can do books, you can do people, you know, all, all different ways, okay, or, or other kinds of book studies, you know, if there's, so, so we're open to, to whatever, all right, okay.
Let's pray. We'll let you go. Good and gracious God, we thank you that in the end you always get the last word. And we know that your word for us is always life. And that in all that you do in our lives, it's a call to repentance, a call to let you bless us and restore us. Um, and just to, to be good for us as a loving father always wants to be so father we pray that as we've been able to make some sense of this crazy and weird book we thank you for um, the richness that is there for the simple story that we're learning um, to know that in the end all that you do um, is meant to bring us back to you so we thank you for your patience for your mercy for your forgiveness for your healing touch and we thank you for this time and all these people gathered around. So bring us back next week that we might do this all again. We thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.